today's webinar. I'd like to welcome back all of our teachers who've joined us in the webinars before and say a big hello to all of the teachers that are joining us for the first time. Here you can see the schedule for course 13. We do have a lot of great topics remaining in this course series, so we look forward to seeing you. All right, the question of the day, how can you participate in the webinars? Can any of our experienced webinar participants answer this question? During the webinar, you'll see moderator Jenny and me working in the chat box but we also rely on our webinar community to help each other. During these webinars, you'll hear but not see the presenter. The way for you to participate is by using the chat box, as many of you are doing. And this is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. Of course, not every question will be answered during the session, as there are often hundreds of amazing teachers participating. However, there is another place you could ask questions, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Your presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These multiple question, choice questions will appear on the screen, screen for you to answer. Some people may experience technical problems, and unfortunately, we can't fix individual technical issues. But we will let you know if we have a global technical problem. If you lose sound for some reason, a great way to follow along is with a caption pod that you can see at the bottom of the screen. Webinar courses consist of six webinars. During the course, webinars take place every other Wednesday. And if you attend at least four out of six webinars, you'll receive an e-certificate from your regional English language office or local U.S. Embassy. To ensure you're eligible for your e-certificate, we'll ask you to submit your attendance at the very, very end of the webinar. We promise we'll let you know when to do it. Please do not submit this information before we request it, or your attendance will not be counted. For individuals, meaning you're participating alone at your own computer, we will just need your email address. For viewing hosts, meaning groups of teachers watching the webinar together in the same room, we will only need the viewing host's email address and the number of participants attending the viewing session. You can see examples here on the slide. Many of you are familiar with our main site, but if you haven't registered yet, please do join the site. It's a way to continue the discussions about each webinar topic and to interact with colleagues from around the world, and you also get access to many great additional teaching resources. The question, how many of you have already participated in the discussion related to today's topic? If you have, you can raise your hand by clicking on the icon that looks like a little man on the upper right side of the screen. Has anyone participated in the discussion? If you have, raise your hand. All right, I'm seeing lots of hands going up. Great. And last but not least, we encourage you to visit our website, AmericanEnglish.state.gov, where we have a wide range of resources available for teachers and learners in English. Okay, on to today's session. To get to, together today, we're going to consider how to engage students and help them develop the skills needed to make them better readers. Our presenter will demonstrate how to help struggling readers delight in reading while improving their comprehension, speed, and vocabulary through interactive classroom activities. We will explore practical and easy strategies that you can incorporate in your classes including pre-reading activities and activities to stimulate critical and creative thinking. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Serena Chu Raz. A native of San Francisco, California, Serena is an ESOL professor at Skyline College in San Bruno, California. 
She served as an English language fellow at the Universidad Autónoma de San Luis Potosí in Mexico, and she, there she trained teachers in the teacher certification program. Her experience includes coordinating and teaching English for the Puente Project at Laney College, an academic success program for underserved community college students, and teaching Vietnamese refugees in Hong Kong. She's presented at the 2012 and 2013 TESOL Convention and has presented teacher training webinars through the Shaping the Way We Teach English program and with the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. Serena speaks Spanish and Cantonese. So without further ado, I'll say a big welcome to Serena. Thank you so much and a very warm welcome to all the webinar participants. Thank you for joining us today for easy reading activities to engage students. And it's great to see so many participants from all over the world. Um, I see Julia from Peru, um, Alia from Kazakhstan, Simone from Brazil, Lottie from Nambia, Lillian from Paraguay, we have Maria and Bella from the Russian Federation. Um, and we have lots of participants from the Philippines, Michael, Rebecca, Rochelle. Welcome to everybody. And uh, hopefully during the next 90 minutes, I can give you some easy and practical activities and strategies that you can use in your classroom to help your students become more engaged readers. But before we get started, let's play a little game because you don't know too much about me. So let's do a little icebreaker. And this icebreaker is called Two Truths and a Lie. I'm going to put up three sentences about me on the screen. And two of the sentences are true and one is a lie. So you have to guess which one is the lie. All right, the first sentence is, I am going to Spain in five days. The next one is, I lived in Mexico for two years. And number three is, I hate spicy food. Okay, so take a look at these three sentences and try to guess which one is a lie. All right, I'm going to tell you the answer. There's lots of, lots of action happening in the chat box. So number one is true. I am going to Spain and Portugal in five days. I'm going with my husband and my sister. And it's my summer vacation right now, so I'm really looking forward to a wonderful vacation in Spain and Portugal. Number two is true. I did live in Mexico for two years. I lived in Querétaro, and I lived in San Luis Potosí. And number three, I hate sp spicy food, so obviously that is the lie. I actually love spicy food. And some of my favorite foods are Thai, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Mexican. All right, so just a little fun activity for you to get to know me. One more question. Do you see that picture of me? Try to guess where I am in this photo. So you can type in your ch chat box right now. I'll give you a hint. It's not in the United States or Canada. Okay, somebody said Mexico City, Spain, Peru, Venice. All right, it is in Mexico, but no one has gotten the city yet. Okay, the city that I'm in is actually called Guanajuato, so it's in central Mexico. All right, so. Before we started the webinar, a lot of you took the poll and you answered this question, what are some struggles or problems that your students have with reading? So um, let's take a look at those poll results. Um, it looks like a lot of you um, wrote down that your biggest struggle with students is they cannot comprehend what they read. Uh, many of you said that they read too slowly, 
And a big one was they don't have enough vocabulary. So let me put up here some common um, problems that students have with reading. So teachers say this a lot. Uh, their students don't like reading. Students read too slowly. They have limited vocabulary. There's a lack of comprehension. Lack of critical thinking. So a lot of students will just read the words on the page, but then if you ask them a question about what they read, they might not be able to say anything about the reading. They don't read enough. A lot of our students don't enjoy reading and they won't pick up a book. They don't like it. And they don't connect to the reading. They don't see how the reading is connected to their own lives. So what happens to our students who are poor readers? What happens is that many of our readers get into the vicious cycle of the poor reader. So they might start off as slow or poor readers, and they get really frustrated. They don't understand. And when they become frustrated, they'll read less. If they read less, they'll have less vocabulary. They won't be able to develop their vocabulary, which leads to low comprehension. And you can see this vicious cycle of the poor reader continues to go around and around. So the big question is, how do we get our students out of this vicious cycle of the poor reader? Now, what we would like to see is this, the virtuous cycle of the good reader. So good readers are those readers who enjoy reading. They read more, and when they read more, they develop more vocabulary. When they develop more vocabulary, they have higher comprehension. And then it keeps on going around and around in the circle. So how do we get our students to get into the virtuous cycle of the good reader? In this webinar, we're going to discuss four strategies to help struggling readers. So number one, we're going to talk about helping our students connect reading to their prior knowledge. So connecting reading to their experience, connecting reading to what they know already, and getting students interested in their reading before they even begin reading. Our second strategy is using graphic organizers or visuals to help students organize the information that they read. Our third strategy is to help students do close reading. And as you know, many of our students, they'll just read something really quickly, they'll skim through it, but they don't really comprehend it or read it closely. And our fourth strategy is to encourage critical thinking. And as you know, um, with a lot of reading, sometimes like the questions that students are asked to answer are just multiple choice, fill in the blank, or true false questions. And that doesn't really encourage critical thinking. So we're going to talk about strategies on how we can get students to think and discuss the readings. All right, so our first strategy for today is to connect reading to prior knowledge. And some of the pre-reading activities that we'll discuss are the KWL chart, give one, get one, a mind mapping activity, and a pre-reading quiz. So first of all, let me ask you again, um, why is it important to help students connect reading to their prior knowledge? So a lot of you answered the poll at the beginning of the webinar. And you said that it's important to connect students reading to prior knowledge and activate their prior knowledge because it connects them to the reading, to what they already know. And also, it gets students interested in reading, and it will help them to understand the readings better. So let's go ahead and look at our first activity, which is the KWL chart. So go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, so click on the icon at the top right-hand corner if you have used a KWL chart before. So a KWL chart, the K stands for what I know, the W stands for what I want to know, and the L stands for what I've learned. 
And this is a great activity for your students to do before they begin the reading. It'll get them interested in the topic. So since I'm from San Francisco, let's say that I'm going to give you a reading on San Francisco. Now some of you might already know some things about San Francisco. So in the K column, you would have your students write down what they know already about San Francisco. So you might already know that Oh, the Golden Gate Bridge. I've heard about that. I know that there's the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. So the students would write that down in the K column because they already know that. Or some of your sports fan students out there might say, oh, I know about the San Francisco Giants. That's the baseball team. So go ahead right now in the chat box, go ahead and write down some things that you already know about San Francisco. Let's see what you write down. Okay, um, in Kenya, you wrote about the 49ers, the MoMA, I'm surprised you know about that. Steep Roads, Ghirardelli, Alcatraz. All right, the weather is good all year. All right, these are good ones. And so as you can see, this gets students talking about the topic before they begin reading. So you can have the students fill out the KWL chart individually, and then afterwards you can have them share the KWL charts in a, in, uh, as partners or in a group. So after they fill out the K, excuse me, you have the students uh, fill out the W column. That's what they want to know. So they'll write down questions about San Francisco in the second column. So what questions do you have about San Francisco? Go ahead and write those in the chat box right now. So students might write down, uh, what's the population of San Francisco? What types of food is there in San Francisco? What types of universities are there? So again, have your students share their answers with each other and this will elicit more discussion and more interest before they do the reading. Now the L column, as you can see, you're, you're going to fill that out at the very end after they've done the reading. So after the students have done the reading on San Francisco, then they'll write down what they've learned so you can check their comprehension. And again, they can share their answers with each other. I have include, included the KWL chart on the Ning site. So you can go ahead and print that out but even better, instead of photocopying so many papers, you can just have your students draw this KWL chart on a piece of paper. Or if you have access to poster paper or a chalkboard, you can have your students do it there as well. All right, so this is a great activity. Students love it and it's very interactive. Let's look at the next activity, which is very similar to the KWL chart because it gets students thinking about the topic. This one is called Give One, Get One. And as you can see, there are nine squares on this piece of paper. You can do 12 squares if you want. And again, you give the students the topic. So let's say again, um, the, the topic is San Francisco. And in each of the squares, the students will write down one sentence that they know about the topic. So for example, they might write down in the first square, oh, I've heard that San Francisco has cable cars. Or they might write down, oh, San Francisco is located in the state of California. Or it is a peninsula. So first have the students do this activity individually and then make them stand up, walk around the classroom. This is a great kinesthetic activity to get them moving and have them share their answers with the other classmates. And the reason why this is called give one, get one is because they can give one piece of information or more to another classmate and hopefully they'll be able to get um, another piece of information from their classmates. So they'll go ahead and start filling out the squares the point here is not to get everything correct or to fill up all the squares, 
they might only be able to fill out, you know, four or five squares here. The point is to get them interested and discussing the reading. So you can imagine now, if you give your students a reading about San Francisco, they're going to be looking for the answers. They're going to be really interested in what they read. I got this handout off of the website freeology.com. It's a free website with tons of graphic organizers like this. So go ahead and check it out. I did attach this Give One, Get One handout to the Ning website. So you can go ahead and um, print that out if you like. All right, um, some of you may have heard of mind mapping. So um, this is a really useful activity. So let's say you're going to give the students a reading on Chinese New Year. So before you just hand them the reading and say, OK, everyone start reading, um, have them do a mind mapping activity. So have them write the word Chinese New Year in the middle of the paper and put a circle around it. And you can have them do this individually, or even better, have them work in pairs or in groups. So either on a piece of paper, or you can do this on a chalkboard or poster paper. So um, tell the students that, OK, you're going to do a reading on Chinese New Year. What do you already know about Chinese New Year? So you are tapping into their prior knowledge. So some of your students might say, oh, I heard about the Chinese zodiac, and I know that this year is the year of the horse. I also know that dragons and tigers are really important animals in the Chinese culture. They might know um, about superstitions, that the red color is lucky. They might know that uh, Chinese people eat traditional foods during Chinese New Year, and they might have heard about a dragon dance. So this is a great activity. They can make as many circles as they want um, and you know, just have, write down as many notes as they can. It's almost like a brainstorming activity that gets them thinking about the topic. All right. Here's a fun one that you can do with your students. And this is called a pre-reading quiz. So let's say you're going to give them the reading on Chinese New Year. And you give them a very brief quiz. So as you can see on the left-hand column, you have the before reading. And you have the agree or disagree column. So give them this quiz before they do the reading. Now as you can see um, on the right-hand side, you can give them the quiz later after they're finished doing the reading to check their comprehension. So let's take a look at some of these questions. So you might ask your students, number one, it is unlucky to cut your hair before Chinese New Year. And they'll check agree or disagree. Number two, you should clean your house before Chinese New Year. Number three, the panda bear is one of the animals in the Chinese zodiac. And number four, Chinese people wear white during New Year's celebrations. And number five, lucky money is given to young people in red envelopes during Chinese New Year. All right, so let's try it. So I'm going to give you this pre-reading quiz right now. And let's take a look at the questions. And pretend you are going to complete a reading about celebrating Chinese New Year. So go ahead and answer the questions to this pre-reading quiz. I'll give you a few moments to do this. And then after the students are finished taking the pre-reading quiz, have them compare their answers with a partner and with each other, because that will get the discussion going. And the point here, again, is not to see how many they can get correct, but it's just to get them interested in the reading. 
So let's see. Oh, it looks like a lot of people think number one is true. A lot of people say agree for number two. Number three, lots of disagrees. Number four, most people say disagree. And number five, a lot of people say agree. All right, do you all want to know the answers? Now, by this time, your students will be dying to know the answers to these questions. And so they'll ask you, teacher, please tell us the answer. And this is when you tell them, I'm not going to tell you the answer. To get the answer, you need to do the reading. <laughs> so um, since you're not going to do the reading in this webinar, I'll go ahead and I'll be nice and I'll give you the answers. So number one, it is unlucky to cut your hair before or Chinese New Year. Um, actually, that one is disagree. That is false. It's actually unlucky to cut your hair after Chinese New Year because the Chinese believe that if you cut your hair after the New Year or um, immediately after the New Year, then you're going to cut all your good luck off. Number two, you should clean your house before Chinese New Year. Um, that is true, so agree is the right answer. You should clean your house because you should have a fresh start and you should sweep away all of the bad luck from the previous year. Number three, the panda bear is one of the animals in the Chinese zodiac. That is false, so that is disagree. There are many animals in the Chinese zodiac, such as the dragon, the tiger, and the monkey, but the panda bear is not one of them. Number four, Chinese people wear white during New Year's celebrations. That is false. Chinese people actually wear white during funerals. And the color red and often yellow is worn during New Year's because those are lucky colors. And number five, lucky money is given to young people in red envelopes during the New Year. That is true. So it's a great thing to be a young person during Chinese New Year because you get a lot of lucky money. All right, so as you can see, um, this quiz just gets the conversation going. Students love it. When they go ahead and do the reading on Chinese New Year, they will be looking for the answers to these um, quiz questions. And don't forget, after they finish the reading, have them do the agree and disagree column. So you can give them a post-reading quiz as well. All right. Hope you all did well on that quiz. <laughs> all right. Let's take a look at our next one. And um, our next strategy that we're going to talk about today is using graphic organizers. And um, how many of you out there have used graphic organizers or visuals before? Please raise your hand. All right, looks like some of you have used graphic organizers. So we're going to talk about a Venn diagram, a two-column chart, the four-column chart, a storyboard, and some vocabulary cards. So as you can see, um, here is a graphic organizer called the Venn diagram. So first of all, what is a graphic organizer? You can go ahead and type your answers into the chat box. And graphic organizers are great because it allows students to organize their information. So when students read, it's just kind of a big mess. There's so much information there. They don't really know what the main points are. Um, and they just get really confused. The comprehension is very difficult. So you can give them an organizer like this, a Venn diagram. So let's say they're reading about two different topics. So um, there's the circle on the left and the circle on the right. So the, in the circle on the left, they would write down all the main ideas, um, everything that describes the first topic. And on the right-hand side, everything that describes the second topic. And then in the middle, that's what the two topics have in, co uh, in common. You can also do this for two different characters that they read in a story. Um, what are their differences and what are their similarities? And just having this visual 
allows students to really organize their information and to um, just see the information on a piece of paper. So have the students do this um, individually and have them share their answers with each other. All right, here's another graphic organizer and this one is super easy, just like I promised. Everything's going to be easy in this webinar. So this is just a two column chart. Simply have the students write two columns on their piece of paper. And so if they are reading about a controversial topic, um, give them a yes and a no column. So let's say you're um, giving the students a reading about should children be paid to attend school? What do you think? And have the students discuss. So um, have them work in groups and write down notes on the yes column. Yes, children should be paid to attend school. Attending school is like a job. Um, paying them money will motivate them more. It will have get them to have higher attendance. So you brainstorm all the ideas. On the no column, you'll do the same thing. No, students should not be paid to attend school. It will only demotivate them. It will make them lose the true purpose of coming to school. Um, and then the students will discuss um, either side and then they will come up with a conclusion. And so what is, what is the conclusion? What's your final answer? Do you think students should be paid or not be paid to attend school? So again, super simple activity, but gets them thinking about the reading. And it also organizes the material in the reading. All right, here is a four column chart or graphic organizer. And you can do this in any way that you like. Um, this is one way that I like to do it. Um, I'll have the students read a chapter and I like to have them work collaboratively in groups. And so um, they'll make a four column chart like this and after they're finished looking at the chapter and reading the chapter, they'll write down the main ideas on the far left hand corner and they'll of course in order to write down the ideas they have to discuss. In the second column to focus on vocabulary they can write down vocabulary words and their definitions. In the third column they'll write down important quotations. Um, they can also write down why they feel that quotation is important. And in the final column, they'll write down their comments, their questions, their thoughts, anything that's connected to their own lives. So I really like this and students enjoy it as well because again, like I said before, the information is just so much in the reading and how are they supposed to organize it? So this is one way you can help the students have a visual and then they can keep this and so if they have a test later, um, they can use this for study. Um, oh, here's a good question. Uh, Ambika in India said, what do you mean by an important quotation? And um, we're going to discuss this a little bit more in our next strategy when we talk about close reading. And so I think it's really important for students when they do the reading to be able to choose important or key quotations. What are strong lines that they see in the reading? What are some lines or sentences that are significant or jump out at you? And so those are going to really be the main ideas of the reading, right? So having students choose either one important quotation or a few important quotations that will help them focus on the main idea and get them discussing about what's important about the reading. Um, the level of this activity, I think um, Morbarak from Uzbekistan, you had a question. Um, this might be, I would say, more for intermediate level or for a higher level. So um, let me show you an activity that might be better for a lower level. So this is the next one. Um, this is called a storyboard and I absolutely love this 
activity because it incorporates art and students who are artistic really like this one. And again, this might be good for lower levels as well. Um, when students read, they often get confused about the sequence of what they read, right? They get confused what came first, what came second, what happened next. So in this graphic organizer, students will draw six themes from the reading. Um, I suppose if they saw a movie, they could also do this for a movie as well. And so uh, the students would draw one scene in order. Uh, so they would draw six scenes here. And as you can see, underneath each of the scenes, there's room for them to write a sentence or two, um, just summarizing what's happening in this scene. And then after the students are finished, you can have them share their storyboards with each other so they can review the sequence of the story. And this is a great visual to help students, again, organize uh, the information in the reading and remind them of the sequence of the reading. Students really enjoy this, and it really helps the artistic learners in the class. All right. Now on to a, another activity that you can use. A lot of you told me at the beginning of the webinar that your students struggle with vocabulary. And I think it's really important to help our students develop their vocabulary so they can get out of the cycle of the, vis um, the poor reader and get into the cycle of the virtuous reader. So um, some of you may have used flashcards before in your classes, but here is a different way of using flashcards. So uh, you can have your students uh, take uh, an index card and on the front of the index card, they would write down the vocabulary word. And ideally, this would be a vocabulary word that they take from the reading, so it's connected. So let's say one of the vocabulary words is pompous. So they'll write down the word pompous on the front of the card. And then on the back of the vocabulary flashcard, you're going to have them break it up into four squares. And then as you can see, at the top left-hand corner, the students will write down uh, adjective or the part of speech. In the upper right-hand corner, the students will write down the definition of the word. So this can either be a dictionary definition, or they can write the definition in their own words. Um, or they might even write down the definition in their native language. In the lower left-hand corner, the students can write down a sentence. So this one, um, the word pompous, means self-important or arrogant. And the sentence could be, my date last night thought he was amazing but I found him to be a pompous jerk. So you, your students can write down a really funny sentence because that will help them to remember the word better. Or another option is for them to write down the sentence from the reading so they can remember the vocabulary word in context. So it's really important for them to write down the sentence so um, they can do this, so they can see the word in context. And then in the lower right-hand corner, have the students just make a small little sketch, something really simple, a picture or a visual, to help them uh, remember what the word is. So here we have a little picture of a person being self-important or arrogant. So um, you can have, this, you have them do it on uh, flashcards. That's the best. Um, if you don't have access to flashcards, you can do it on paper and have the students um, cut up some paper and uh, do it on the front and back. Um, so let's see, Min Shan from Taiwan said how to adapt the card for lower learners. Um, you, might, you might not need to do all four squares because of, um, it might be too much information. So you could simply just do um, a picture on the back. 
with a sentence. So, um, you know, lower learners, they might not need to write down the part of speech or the definition. Just a simple picture and maybe a sentence that might be good for lower learners. All right, so hopefully you got some information here about graphic organizers. So let's do a little review. The first strategy to help our students uh, who are struggling with reading is to activate their prior knowledge. So ask your students what they know about the topic already to elicit some interest and to get them discussing the topic before they even do the reading. It will help so much. And the second strategy is to use graphic organizers to help organize information and to help students visualize information. Our third strategy is close reading. And as you know, a lot of our students, uh, they're in such a rush to finish the reading. They'll read something very quickly, they'll um, uh, scan it or skim it, and they'll say, oh, teacher, I finished doing the reading. And um, they really have not interacted with the reading. They have not engaged with the reading at all. It's just, um, just super fast. And basically what they've done is they've looked at all the words on the page, but they haven't really absorbed it. So uh, in this section, a close reading, we're going to discuss engaging with the text three times. I think it's really important, especially with difficult text, to have the students engage and read the text three times. And I'm going to show you how to do that. We're going to talk also about a think aloud. Now, um, virtuous readers, the good readers, they always have thoughts going through their heads as they read. Uh, when you and I read, we have questions, uh, we might be confused, um, we might have comments, uh, we might be surprised over something. So we always have thoughts. Now, a lot of poor readers, they might not have these thoughts uh, when they are doing the reading. They're just simply reading the words on the page. So I'm going to show you how to model a think aloud with your students. Um, we're also going to talk about annotation which is taking notes on the reading. And finally, I'm going to show you a really fun reader's bookmark that you can use with your students. All right, so for close reading, engaging the text three times. All right, so the first read. A good idea is to have your students read with a pencil in their hand. So have a pencil or pen in their hand and have them read and circle vocabulary words that are difficult or they don't understand. You might have them underline important points or just put a star next to important points. Have them use symbols to mark up the reading. This way they are actively reading. They're not just sitting back passively. They're, they have their pen in their hand. And so as you can see on the screen, here are some symbols that your students can use when they're reading. They can use a check mark for I understand this. They can use a star, which means, oh, this is an important point. They can write down a question mark if they are unsure about something or they have a question. Um, a, an exclamation point for I am surprised. And they can write down the infinity mark for this reminds me of something else. So for the first read, just get them actively reading and using some of these symbols. Um, you don't have to use these symbols. These are just mine. You, uh, many teachers come up with other symbols. I know some teachers like to use uh, like a heart, uh, have the students draw a heart if they like something or a happy face if they find something funny in their reading. So um, you can develop your own. For the second read, read to your students. This is when the teacher reads the text out loud to the students to model fluent reading. So don't forget the importance of this. Um, this is great for lower levels, for intermediate, for even advanced levels. And um, now why is this so important for teachers to read the text out loud? Well, um, 
you know, a lot of students don't know what fluent reading sounds like. So um, if the teacher reads out loud to the students, it allows them to hear what a fluent uh, reader sounds like. It helps them to uh, get the pronunciation and listen to fluent reading. As you're doing this, have the students follow along with their finger or pencil so you know that they're following along. And also, uh, when you're finished, have them discuss first impressions and, and notes. All right. So that's the second read, getting students uh, to just listen to the teacher read. On the third read, the teacher will model a think aloud and the annotation. And finally, the students can do a think aloud and annotation in pairs. So think aloud, like I said before, is um, a lot of readers, a lot of good readers, have thoughts going through their minds as they read. They have lots of questions. Um, they might be confused. They have comments. I'm going to give you an example right now of a think aloud. And you should model this for your students because um, your students should get an idea of what it's like to think out loud when you're reading. So here's an example. Here's our reading on Chinese New Year. So you can read this out loud to your students. And here's an example. You might read and say, okay, Chinese New Year is celebrated all over the world. In China, it's a time when families take holidays and get together. Oh, okay, it sounds like this is a very important holiday because all the families get together. They gather at each other's homes for visits and meals and often have a special feast on New Year's Eve. Okay, right here, I don't know what the word gather means, but it looks like that means to come together. And I don't know what the word feast means, but I'm just guessing that it means a dinner or a meal. Hmm. Wow, this sounds like a lot of fun. And if they have a special dinner on this day, I wonder what they eat. I wonder what are the foods that Chinese people eat on New Year's Eve. So as you can see, the teacher is thinking out loud, and the students will hear the teacher think out loud. And the students are going to do this when you're finished. And then you can continue. Well, before the new year, it is a tradition to clean house, to sweep away all the bad luck from the old year. Oh, that's so interesting. I never knew that. And often at midnight on New Year's Eve, People open all the doors and windows to let the old year leave. This is interesting that Chinese people have uh, these uh, things that they do for New Year's because in my country, we also have some different traditions that we celebrate for the New Year's. All right, so uh, let me show you how to do annotation. Um, so along with the think aloud, you would have the students also do annotations. And um, here it might take it might look something like this. So you might have them put a star next to in China. It's a time when families take holidays and get together. And you might have them highlight certain phrases or key quotations that they find important. Um, they might circle vocabulary words here like gather, feast, and tradition. And have them write down their questions in the margin and in the reading. So here um, where it says a special feast on New Year's Eve, the students might write down, oh, large meal, what do they eat? So you can show this to the students. Um, on the second paragraph, um, if something is surprising, you can write down an exclamation point. Um, you can write down, oh, the new year is a time to start fresh. And also they can write down, my country also has traditions for New Year's. And they can write the infinity sign because they're making a connection with their own country. So um, this is great for students to do. Um, they can do this individually first. 
but then they can share this with a partner uh, so they can um, discuss what they felt was important and what, what they felt was kind of confusing for them. We have a question from Asma in Bangladesh and um, Asma asked, can we let the students use their mother tongue while thinking aloud? Um, definitely at the higher levels, you're going to have them use English and that's ideal for the more advanced levels. And I think for lower levels, you can, um, you can have them use their native language and just try it out and see how it goes. Because, um, you know, even when we are reading in a foreign language, a lot of times our thought process takes place in our native language. So I know when I was learning Spanish, um, I would be reading in Spanish, but a lot of times my thoughts would be in English, which, which is my native language. And so I think that's okay um, because the point here is uh, just to get students to understand the thought process that happens when you're reading. And you should have lots of thoughts going through your mind. So I think that's okay. All right, so those were the, um, the three ways of reading, close reading with your students and the think aloud. Um, so you might want to model this annotation either on the board. Um, if some of you have an overhead projector, you can put this on the overhead projector um, and, and do the annotation together with the students. Uh, if you don't have an uh, overhead projector, you can go ahead and do it on the board. All right. I wanted to show you this reader's bookmark. This is really fun, and I have attached this to um, the, the Ning website. So you can go ahead and print this out, and this is something really easy that you can do. You can just photocopy this and cut this out, and uh, you can photocopy it on colored paper if you have that, and cut it out and pass it out to your students. And so it's just something really fun for the students to keep. It's like a little gift, and they can keep it in their books. And um, this is great because it's another way to help your students read closely. So as you can see, as students are reading, it's nice to have them write down vocabulary words, um, you know, have, have a, a, a place to uh, write down that. They can also use the back of the bookmark if they run out of space here. But here are some great questions for students to think about as they're reading. So as they're reading closely, you want the students to talk to the text, to interact with the text. You don't want them just to read the words. So here are some great sentence starters that your students can use as they're reading. And um, because it's on a bookmark, it's always there in front of them. So uh, things like, oh, I think, I wonder, I notice, oh, this reminds me of something in my life, or this is confusing, all right? Students should talk about what's confusing in the reading, or I like this part because I think the character is feeling blank because or I think blank will happen next because, so that's a predicting activity. But this is great because it's right there in front of them all the time. So reminding the students to interact and engage closely with the text. So check that out. That, uh, that's um, available for you to photocopy on the name website. All right. So. Let's review the strategies again. Number one is to activate prior knowledge, getting students to uh, uh, think about what they already know about the topic before they do the reading. Number two is to use graphic organizers and visual to help students organize their reading. Number three is to do a close reading and get your students to really engage closely with the text and ask questions closely with the text instead of just reading something in a couple minutes and um, say they're finished. Our fourth strategy for today is to encourage critical thinking. 
And um, in this section, we're going to talk about asking open-ended questions. There's another activity called Inner Outer Circles. And we're going to discuss the Four Corners activity. So first of all, I would like to ask you, why is it important to encourage critical thinking in our students? So go ahead and type your answers into your chat box. So Felix from Tanzania said it moves students away from mechanical reading. It develops their creativity. All right. Anna said it gets them thinking. All right, these are really great responses. Thank you. Now, as you know, a lot of times our students, like, like I mentioned in the previous section, they will read the words and they'll say they're finished reading. But then if you ask them a question um, that requires some thought in the reading, they might not be able to answer it. So as you know, with a lot of um, our reading, you know, they get a true false question at the end. You know, very simple multiple choice comprehension question. They might get a fill in the blank question. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not completely against multiple choice or fill in the blank, but the problem is it doesn't really encourage thought about the reading. So students could actually um, answer the true and false and multiple choice questions just by reading really quickly and just choosing the answers. But that doesn't really show that they're actually interacting or thinking about the text. So let's look at some ways that we can encourage students to really think about what they're reading. One way to have students think critically about their reading is to ask open-ended questions. So we have a poll here. And which of the questions below is an open-ended question? So you want to encourage your students to use open, you want to ask your students open-ended questions, not just yes-no answers, open-ended questions. So we have A, what is your name? B, how many months are there in a year? Or C, what are some ways to improve your students' reading skills? All right. It looks like a lot of you chose C. What are some ways to improve your students' reading skills? So why would C be an open-ended question? Write that down in the chat box. All right, so what is your name, A? Obviously, that only has one answer. And B also has only one answer. How many months are there in a year? And so I think typically in, in the reading classroom, a lot of our answers have been one answer uh, questions. So, you know, what's the name of the main character's brother? Where does the main character live? Where did this story take place? Those are, you know, yes, no answers, or it just there's only one answer. So I encourage you to ask your students open-ended questions. So just like the question in the example, what are some ways that we can encourage students to read better? There will be multiple answers to that. So here are some examples um, of open-ended questions. And hopefully these questions will encourage your students to think deeply about what they're reading. So you might ask questions with why. Why did? Why did the main character act in this way? Or you might ask the students, what does blank remind you of and why? What does this paragraph remind you of and why? Uh, reading you know, about Chinese New Year, can you make any connections? What are the similarities between the Chinese New Year holiday and a holiday that you celebrate in your country? So again, making connections. There is not one correct answer. There will be multiple answers. And as you can see, this really elicits discussion in your students. Um, do you admire the main character's actions? Why or why not? Explain. 
So again, there's no right or wrong answer. If you were the main character, would you have acted in the same way? So this is great um, to get students talking about the reading. Make, uh, they're making connections. Now don't forget, um, don't be satisfied with just having the students answer those questions. You want to ask follow-up questions to facilitate discussion. So keep asking them more questions. Ask them things like, what makes you say that? Why do you say that? And what happened in the reading that makes you say that? Can you point to the sentence or sentences in the reading that makes you say that? So that way the students are looking back at the text and using evidence from the text to support what they have to say. So they're not just you know, randomly giving their opinion. They're actually using evidence from the, the text as support for their arguments. You might want to ask them, do you agree with this or not? Do you agree with what your classmates said? Why or why not? Tell me more. So um, continue to um, uh, ask probing questions to your students. Ask them to tell you more. Here's an activity that I love, and this activity it always works for me in class. Students love this one so much. This activity is called Inner Outer Circles. It's also called a conversation line. And I like this. This really encourages critical thinking and it gets students out of their seats. As you can see from this picture, the students are actively learning. They have their books in their hands. You can arrange your students like this, either in a line, and as you can see, the students are facing each other. Each student has a partner. You can also put the students in two circles. That's why it's called the inner outer circle. So you have an, the inner circle would be facing um, towards the outside. So um, everyone would be facing one partner. Now what you want to do in this activity is ask them questions about the reading which will get them thinking critically about the reading. And so as you can see, they might have to have the book or the text in front of them in order to answer the questions. So here are some example questions that you could use in the inner outer circles or the conversation line. So possible discussion questions. They discuss this with their partner. So the first question could be, which character in the book did you most identify with and why? So not just one question um, and not just one answer. They can, um, they can have a variety of possible answers. You might ask them, what was your favorite part of the book? What do you think will happen in the next chapter? And that's a great question for predicting. Would you recommend this book to others? Why or why not? Now what you'll do is ask one question at a time. It's too confusing to give them you know, five questions at once. So they're facing their partner and you ask the first question. You might want to write it on the board so they have a visual. Give them about three minutes to discuss the question. It will get really loud in the classroom, but that's great, right? We want to have a really loud and interactive classroom. And so the students will be discussing, all right? And both students will give their opinion on which character in the book they most identified with. Now here's the fun part. After they are finished discussing, after the three minutes is up, you'll yell stop or you'll yell change. And this is when you have the students uh, change partners. So if you're in a line, you will have one of the lines move over one space. And then the person at the end will have to shift over you know, and run towards the other end. And so now all the students will have uh, a different partner and then you can go ahead and ask number two. 
and then uh, with the circle, you would just have one of the circles move one space to the right, for example, and then they'll have a new partner. All right. So this is a good one. Um, I think one of the participants said this might be a good one for a pre-reading activity. So you might want to uh, change the questions. Um, so you might want to just have them talk, you know, what do you know already about Chinese New Year? Discuss. Or another question could be, you know, uh, discuss a holiday that uh, what is your, you know, discuss your favorite holiday from your country. Why do you like that holiday? And what do you, what are some foods that you like during that holiday? And that might be a really interesting pre-reading activity to get students um, anticipating the reading and interested in the reading. So that was a, a really good comment. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, we have a question saying, can we do this in a crowded class? Dun Yuan Van. Yes, this is great for a crowded class. Um, this works well with very, very large classes. Um, the only problem is that, like in my classroom, there's a lot of chairs and desks. So a lot of times you don't know where to put the students. Um, but uh, a lot of times, um, Find, make the students get into a line at the front of the class. If you have access to the outdoors, you can make your students go outside and do this. But this is a really good activity with large groups. All right. Let's take a look at our last activity here. And this is called the Four Corners Activity. And this activity will also elicit critical thinking in your students. Um, your students will love this. This is one of the easiest activities I've ever done. And all you have to do is write down these four words on a piece of paper. Strongly agree, agree, strongly disagree, and disagree. And you just Tape them in the four corners of your classroom. Now, what you're going to do is you are going to put up a sentence on the board that is related to the reading. So for example, if you're doing a reading on racism or race relations in your country, you can put up a controversial statement like this. There is very little racism in my country. And as you can see, there are many different answers to this question. So if the students strongly agree with the statement, the students will get up out of their seats and they will move to the corner that says strongly agree. If they disagree with the statement, They'll get up out of their seats and they will move to the disagree corner. All right, and so on. And as you can see, this is a very kinesthetic activity. It gets the students um, up and moving. Now what you're going to do uh, next is you will have the students discuss this sentence with the people in their corner only. So if they strongly disagree, with this statement, they will discuss why they strongly disagree with this statement with the people in their corner. It might be a good idea for them to write down notes uh, in their notebook and write down all of their arguments. So um, if this is related to a reading, they should have the readings in their hand and they should highlight and make a note of you know, where in the reading do they see sentences to support their argument. Um, this is a great activity. It can be adapted for different levels. Um, this one I have here on the screen will be for a higher level. But um, you can do easier questions for a lower level. Um, so it, it just depends on what reading you're doing. So um, you know, just like the questions I asked before, you can say, oh, I admire the main character's actions. So go to the corner. So that would be a, an easier question. 
All right, so here are some other topics that you could use. Remember, they should be um, semi-controversial, something they could agree or disagree with. So like I said before, kids should be paid to attend school. Animal testing should be banned. The government should put an additional tax on soda to fight obesity. All right. So, um, so, the, so the students will go to their corners. They'll discuss with their groups, come up with their arguments. After they're finished, you will have each corner present their arguments to the whole class. So each group will have an opportunity to argue their side and why they feel that their corner is correct. This would be a, um, a good time to give students some language that they can use to give their opinions. So um, you might write on the board, in my opinion, or from my perspective, or I believe, or I think. And you can also give them language to disagree. Um, I see your point, but, or I don't quite uh, a complete, I don't completely agree with you. So you can give them language in order to uh, present their arguments. So each corner will present their argument. Um, you might want to give them a chance uh, you know, after everybody is finished, they might present some counter arguments if you like, and that's what, where the language comes in. Give them the language, not to, um, you know, scream and yell at each other, but to very politely say, um, okay, I agree with you somewhat, but have you ever thought about this argument? So phrases like that should help your students quite a bit. Um, when all of the corners are finished presenting, then students will have the opportunity to switch corners or change corners if they like. So if they felt that another corner was very persuasive, they can go ahead and change corners. However, before they change corners, they have to explain to the whole class why they are changing corners and which argument was the one that persuaded them. So again, this works well uh, with readings that, um, you know, have a lot of, uh, you know, different opinions to it. So again, this is very, very different from your multiple choice question, right? It gets students really thinking about arguments. It gets them uh, up out of their seats and active. It gets them um, arguing uh, with one, one another politely, of course. Um, it gets them looking back at the text and trying to find support for what they have to say. Um, and it gets them thinking about what their opinions are. So it, it gives them a chance to debate some of these uh, really important um, questions that they have in class. So let's go ahead and try this um, with our participants. So what do you think? I'm going to give you another question. So your question for today is this. People who don't recycle at home should have to pay a fine. So uh, let's say you just did a reading on um, recycling. Oh, and actually, now that I think about it, you could do the Four Corners activity as a pre-reading activity as well. So even before you do the reading with the students, you can um, ask them this question. You know, people who don't recycle at home should have to pay a fine. So um, if you strongly agree, please write down your statement in the strongly agree box. And you don't just have to write down strongly agree. Maybe write down a few words or write down a sentences, sentence on why you strongly agree. Or if you disagree with this, Write down your reasons, because you don't want your students just to say, oh, I agree, I disagree. You want to encourage them to explain why. So go ahead and um, actually write down some sentences and arguments in your box.
All right, those of you in the disagree box, please write down more. <laughs> I want to see your reasons. All right. Okay, these are good ones. So as you can see, your students will come up with a lot of reasons. All right. We have to think about our future. All right. Thank you very much. This looks great. All right, Chi, you say paying a fine does not make sense, Chi from Japan. So in, uh, why do you think it does not make sense? So continue to encourage your students to explain why. Okay. All right, this looks really good. And so um, this, this gets students really thinking about these questions. So um, for this activity, you might want to do a series of questions. I usually like to do three of these during a class period. It does take a long time, obviously. I mean, it, it, you know, for me to do, um, to do three sentences on the board, that would take you know, at least 45 minutes, maybe an hour. But honestly, I feel this activity is really valuable, and it's a good use of class time. Um, at least it's better than just filling in the blank. All right. Thank you, everybody. So um, that is our final activity. Um, just as a review, I hope you can remember all of these four strategies. Uh, remember the first strategy? All right. First strategy, activate prior knowledge. Get your students interested in the reading. Tap in, into their prior experience. What do they know already about the topic? Some examples. Give them a pre-reading quiz. Have them do some mind mapping. KWL charts. Give one, get one. Lead them into doing the reading activity. Thank you, Dolly from India. All right. That was strategy number one. What was strategy number two? All right, you got it. Graphic organizers. So graphic organizers are important, but why are they important? Write down your answers. All right. So um, you wrote down vocabulary flashcards, Venn diagrams. These are, these are good ones. The storyboard, don't forget that one. That's the one where they do the art activity. Using the, um, the two-column chart, the four-column chart. Um, check out freeology.com. There's tons of graphic organizers. Seriously, I think there's about 100 graphic organizers there, and they're all free for you to print out. All right, what was the third strategy again? Third strategy, close reading, all right? We discussed having the students read closely three times, using symbols, reading with a pencil in their hand, asking questions about the reading, and writing the questions in the margin. If they're confused about something, they would write down a question mark. Uh, don't forget to model the close reading with your students. So you can do this in front of the class. Help them to see what goes through your mind when you do the reading. Oh, and don't forget to always read to your students so they can hear about um, the, hear what a fluent reader sounds like. And finally, strategy number four is to elicit critical thinking from your students. So asking open-ended questions, right? Don't just um, simply ask the true-false. Um, get them really discussing. Have them uh, form a conversation line. Get them talking about the text. Open-ended questions. 
you might want to try the four corner activity. All right, so let's end with this today. Uh, reflection, what are your thoughts, comments, and questions about today's webinar? So we went through the four strategies. Go ahead and write down any more questions that you have, your thoughts, anything that you're still confused about. Are, are there any activities here that you feel that you will definitely use? Is there one activity that you remember from the webinar that you could use tomorrow in your class? It's also a good idea to give a reflection activity to your students at the end of the class period as well. So give them about 10 minutes at the end of class. You can even give them five minutes and just have them write down in their journals or on a piece of paper. What are your thoughts, your comments, and your questions about today's reading? Have them write quietly to themselves. And then you can have them share with one another. And again, that's a great way to get them talking about the reading. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed this experience and I really enjoyed sharing some of these recommendations with you. Um, there's just These are some things that worked well for me in my classes and um, hopefully they were useful to you. I wanted to thank you all all. It was great to see so much participation from all over the world. Please check out our Ning website. There are some post-webinar discussions on the Ning website. And go ahead and check out the resources that I've posted on Ning as well. So you all take care and it was such a pleasure being with you today. Bye now. <laughs>